Combat for me uh, at the same time was one of the best things and one of the worst things. You didn't even realize that you were in combat until the shooting stopped and you had time to focus and think about it. Every day you never knew what was going to happen. You lived in a perpetual state of anxiety. You just go, you live like there's no hope, then you don't have to worry about it. I got out of the aircraft and walked into a minefield to pick up patients. They were already in the minefield. You're walking dead in a way, it's, um, and it makes things easier for, for what you have to go and do. Returning home from combat was a mixed bag. I felt relieved and like there was a weight off my shoulders. But I didn't realize that I was hurt. Deploying was an easier transition because we had had training for that. There's no training for returning. So I, 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 I didn't seek help because I didn't think there was anything wrong. I just thought, you know, it's what happens. You're a drug seeker. Uh, when you're missing two limbs, you're still on basically life support. And that fear of being isolated and completely just completely alone, not knowing, just the unknown, just simply the unknown. You have to constantly prove to people that you're still normal, that you're still human, uh, when all they look at you at is damaged goods. I'm not broken. There is a military civilian gap in America. There is a divide in understanding between the American public and the men and women who have served our country in uniform. And this divide is growing. There are facilities here for further Millions have returned from combat and service past and present, seeking a way to reconnect to community, friends, and family. Many combat veterans, however, return with challenges to overcome. The moment a veteran is injured, they begin navigating a complex terrain of geography, medical systems, providers, benefits, records, and treatments. The film you are about to see shares the journey of veterans from their most vulnerable moments to their return home, but home is not where the journey ends for an ailing veteran. Major amputations, orthopedic injuries, illnesses, post-traumatic stress, and traumatic brain injury create new challenges to be faced, challenges that they must often face alone and without strong advocates to help guide them through the complex waters of military, VA, and civilian medical systems. When we listen to one soldier, one voice and one story at a time, we can learn the things that we need to know to help our wounded veterans to achieve victories and not become victims. There's always that one, one little bit in the back of your mind that you're not sure things are really possible, but it is possible, not through just what you want to happen, but that you show yourself and you prove that through ambition and determination and uh, remaining focused, anything is possible. That's what's happening right here in this moment.
Oh, you can keep filming me. You sure? Yeah. Okay. I mean, totally up to you, man. Combat for me, uh, at the same time, was one of the best things and one of the worst things. Uh, working with the people that I worked with when I was in Afghanistan, uh, something I'll never forget. I don't think I'll ever forget a single day of it. Uh, how close you get to everybody, how good of friends you are. I was on a combat patrol in June of 2012 in Afghanistan. Uh, I was one of a few driving a dirt bike, and there were some other vehicles that we had. And while I was transitioning overwatch positions, I drove over what's called a pressure plate IED improvised explosive device. I drove over top of it, instantly everything went white. Uh, and I was in this weird state of conscious and unconscious at the same time. Immediately had phantom sensation in my hand and when I saw that I tried to roll on my right arm to stop the bleeding when that happened I felt my left leg hit the ground where I thought my right leg was and uh, being a medic I knew that I had one limb that was basically a partial amputation I had a full amputation I knew my pelvis was crushed and I thought I was down to the seconds of before I lost so much blood I was gonna lose consciousness and uh, whatever happened after that uh, unfortunately, I believed I wouldn't uh, make it at all. Sales are five, four, three, two, one, two. A buddy of mine got to me as I was trying to break it off, and I said, tourniquet, tourniquet, tourniquet. And uh, he applied a tourniquet to my leg, and as he was doing that, another guy got to me and applied one to my arm. They did an excellent job uh, to stop the bleeding and to keep me awake. Once the helicopter got there and I was still conscious, that was, I was kind of like, you know, being a medic and knowing the extent of my injuries, I was like, even though my chances are pretty, pretty slim, but these guys have done such a good job. Uh, they probably don't even know it. They just increased my chance of survival by 10,000%. Uh, and I was conscious the entire time from when I woke up and tried to self-treat to when I was rolled into the OR in Kandahar Hospital. How you doing? Tell me where you hurt. Okay. Sure. Cycle that pressure again, please. Take a breath for me. I know what's going on right now. Good. You got that ID or not? And give her a break. 50th Academy ID, please. Give me a scissors. What's his blood pressure? Give it to me. Blood pressure 74. Need blood from Trauma Bay 4. Okay, give me a knife. It took me a long time to be able to talk about this uh, experience, even to my girlfriend, because it was just so devastating to me. We, uh, we were on a mountain patrol one day. We were in vehicles, we were in MRAPs. We were on patrol, and uh, two little girls came running out, probably, uh, oldest was about four or five. Introduced myself or whatever to one of the locals, um, a man, and he was there with uh, his son, we had like a, a bomb sniffing dog. That was that was like the first that was the first one in there, but um I was like right behind that guy. I see a guy crying, I see a girl being held with blood all over her face and a baby with uh, blood all over its face, and a turned over motorcycle. Uh, we called them toe poppers. The Russians used to drop them uh, when they came and uh, they looked like little toys, so all the kids would pick them up, they'd blow up in their face. Now, I had a, a great big two liter bottle of water uh, handed him and he indicated gestured he would share it with him and his son and guys sitting there holding her crying 
looking at me with desperation to, to do something. I would stepped over it or I would stepped on it, but I was um, a couple yards away and an IED went off. When I saw the man uh, again, um, he was packing up everything and he was alone. We kept trying to tell her to stop and uh, she didn't stop and it blew up in our face. He lost both of his legs um, and so we tried to um, put tourniquets on um, both his legs and everything. We didn't have a terp with us, but, you know, we were like, hey, obviously these people are fucked up. Can you take them? And we pointed to the base. Just beyond, behind him, um, there was a bundle on the ground that he had wrapped up. Ripped her, all of her fingers off. Ripped off a part of her face and uh, peppered the hell out of her sister behind her. The bone was so hot that it actually, like, burned my hand and the other guy's hand. They take the oldest girl and put her in the truck. They almost leave the baby. And so, I mean, there was, it's, it's rough because you're trying to put on this tourniquet on this guy and, you know, there's basically nothing left. I could see this, his right hand, the boy's hand. It was sticking out of the burlap. And it's just the most humbling and sad moment of my life is when I pick up this little one-year-old girl who's, who's covered in blood I carry her to this truck because they abandoned her. That, uh, she died. She didn't get out of there and get better medical attention. Uh, but they refused to let us take her out, and uh, she ended up passing. And I could see the little grains of rice still, you know, between his fingers and his palm. We put him on the plane, I mean, on, on the helicopter, and um, then we had to pick up the rest of his body parts and everything, so. Radio went to the base to tell them they're coming. They never went, never got there, didn't go. I don't know what they did with them. I see that, I see that every Christmas. I still see that boy, I still see his hand. I have to live with the worst decision of my life. That I should have medevaced them, I didn't, and they probably died as a result of that. So what the med student should take from that is you have the final say. You do what you think is right no matter what anyone else is telling you. If you think something's right and everyone's telling you it's wrong, but you know in your heart it's the right thing to do, do that. Because if not, you'll be me thinking about that night for the rest of your life. My job in combat is, to me, a very sacred one because I'm responsible for life. I'm responsible for taking care of those who are sick and wounded. So it's a very big responsibility that I carry because the person I'm caring for is somebody's son, somebody's daughter, mother or father, and I can't think of any bigger responsibility in my life. There's no feeling in the world like saving lives. When you overcome obstacles, terrain, weather, enemy activity, and you're able to get in there and get those guys out, you know, there's nothing like it. A walk off home run, a putt to win the tournament on the last hole, I don't care what it is, lobster dinner, sex, you name it. There's nothing quite like the feeling that you get when you overcome those obstacles and you save that person's life. A flying medevac in combat is probably one of the most intense things you can do. Um, you spend the vast majority of your time sitting around, reading books, watching TVs, telling jokes. You know, you've heard that a million times, but it's so true. You just sit and you're bored, and you're bored, and you're bored, and then something happens. Some kid comes in through the trauma bay, or for me, you, you get caught up in an ambush somewhere. But then when the button gets pushed, or the horn goes off, or the balloon goes up, whatever reference you want to use, it is, you go from zero to 100%, and it is pure terror, and that you've got to deal with everything right now to get the mission done. Would that be a good explanation and answer for the question? Uh, this is an IED blast um, with troops in contact in the, in the KG Pass. 
right along the creek bed, and an IED had, had gone off. It rolled the vehicle over onto its side and um, trapped a couple guys inside. When we landed in, in the LZ, couldn't identify where the, where the rounds were coming from. Um, we were able to take uh, two litter patients. So we load up, close the doors, and again, we couldn't take off vertically. It just So we had to pick up and get some forward airspeed before we could even get out of that valley, and again, snaking in and out as we left. In terms of caring for the wounded, reaction time is everything. That's it, reaction time, period. On average, we were in the neighborhood of seven to eight minutes. Absolute cannot bust is 15 minutes. And it was very, it's a very grave number because you want to be on the way to help somebody. So that's what everybody was preaching, the golden hour. You know, as long as you get them out within an hour. We, I hear planners talk about it all the time. It makes me want to vomit because it's more than that. It's, it's the right people at the right place at the right time. And I always say, you know, the right people are your most experienced. The right place is point of injury. It's not back in the rear and the right time as soon as possible. So I always, you know, I tell people, if you can get there in three minutes, you have a plan to get there in three minutes and you get there in five, then, then you're failing. company of MPs was hit with a, a large IED, but uh, we were told uh, that there was one KIA and four wounded. He had got called for a uh, IED. We were on our way out. We got a call that Bravo Company was ambushed. And when we got the call, they were, they were actively engaged. I had a mass cow incident that I was a part of. We launched multiple aircraft on. One KIA, four urgent to two KIA, three urgent drove this vehicle right into the middle of this thing to kind of block an area of fire. And they're screaming at me, he's going into convulsions. And three or four times I went up, I couldn't figure out how the hell I was going to get in there. It was zero, zero. The walls of the canyon probably went up two or 3,000 feet on either side. My office comes over and says, there's three KIA, two urgent. Taking a lot of fire. There's an RPG that was skimmed off the top of the vehicle. And we're going to give it one more shot, guys. They were getting very nervous. And then we'll, we'll I don't know what the hell we'll do. We were able to get in on our third attempt. Everybody on the ground looked like they had had a pretty rough time. We get him off the vehicle to get him out of there. We just want to get him out of there. And he starts to get, he just loses a pulse and just crashes on me right there. I directed my uh, sister ship to, to return to the FOB with the casualty who was still alive. And we would load up the, the KIA and the, the heroes. There was a point where Todd Wilson looked at me and said, it's, he's, he's dry, there's nothing here. And I kept, I couldn't, I just, one of those things where I just didn't stop. You launch and they're alive and they just, they're passing on you as you're, you're trying to get to them. And there's probably nothing you could have ever done and you know that, but, but it's still hard. And then to see it, it's, you know, it stays with you. Happy birthday! Again! Happy birthday to you! I was in Iraq from December of 2004 to December of 2005 and I was in Afghanistan from May of 2010 to July of 2010. <laughs> We were on our way to pick up a routine patient and in route, they called us and said, we have an urgent medevac and it was four soldiers who were in a vehicle rollover. So we put our night vision goggles on. We had to fly over a few times to look to see where where were we going to do the hoist or where were we going to land? But um, the pilot that I was with was like, no, I don't, I don't think we can get in there. It's kind of too risky. There's a lot of vehicles around. So we decided to do the hoist. Once you're, you know, you're kind of facing the crew chief and you unhook your communications cable and toss it in, you're like, okay, that's it. That's all you know. And then you're going down. Okay, no issues. Uh, medics out. They look to be uh, hold pretty good. Roger. I started spinning really fast towards the bottom. And then all of a sudden, I went flying in the opposite direction. 
and had no idea what was going on, but it was like a sudden forceful jerk. And I just, you know, lost whoever was holding on to me. And because it was night and because I had night vision goggles on, I couldn't really see what was going on, but I just felt myself kind of flying through the air. And then I felt my leg, this whole side of my body hit something really hard. So then I didn't know what was going on. I thought, well, we're being shot at or something's happened or I didn't know what was going on. And I just kind of felt that sensation of kind of like a swinging pendulum through the air. And then eventually I was back in the helicopter. The rotor system had drooped. The pilot started hollering, get her in, and he started pulling me in as soon as he can, but the rise in the terrain as they were taken off, I just kind of slammed into the, to the ground and fractured my femur in two places, and that was it. It was crazy because usually I was the one walking in the hospital with the patient, this is what's going on, and then I was the patient. So I knew everyone that was in there, and if, you know, it was just like, this doesn't happen, the flight medic got hurt, you know? But it was the fastest medevac ever, guaranteed, because as soon as I got hurt, I was back up in the helicopter. But I'm, I'm here, and I'm fine now, and it all worked out okay. I ended up, I, I have an intramedullary rod in my left leg, which they placed when I got to Germany. And then from there, I went to Fort Knox and then home. Essentially, we are an ICU in the air. Uh, Three-man team uh, taking care of the worst of the worst uh, and getting them back within hours of injury. You can imagine in your civilian hospital, you've got nice rooms, ventilators, any equipment you could possibly have, monitors galore. Just imagine the worst patient requiring the most amount of medication, sedation, pressors, blood, bleeding out, but they gotta get home eventually. And how are they gonna get home? We're gonna take them home. That's our job. Our blood pressure is 91 over 55. Okay, now let's look at the line. All right. See what the problem is. The biggest injury that I had when I was in combat was when the lower portion of my face was blown off uh, by a rocket propelled grenade. And like my lip was just hanging there off my, off my body and I was bleeding everywhere. And the medic's like, uh, uh, the, the guy who pulled me out of the vehicle started puking. And I'm like, it's okay, man, I'm, I'm fine, don't worry about it. And the medic comes over, wraps me up, and then uh, they all hell broke loose at that point. Uh, the first thing that happened was I got shot in the shoulder and the side and uh, got thrown to the ground. Uh, after that, it was stand up and do what I know to do. I think the best thing about uh, evacuation was the fact that anywhere I went, um, the medical personnel, the staff, everybody was, was well informed on, you know, what, I, what my condition was. They uh, came in and said, hey, you're leaving right now. Gave me my stuff, rolled the gurney out, threw me onto a cot in, um, into a plane. We flew straight down to uh, Germany. No problems. <laughs> For in the midst of all this preparation and this training for destruction, there went on an opposite kind of preparation. Preparation for the business of saving life. Prior to CCAT being developed, it would take months sometimes for somebody who was injured to get back to the States or back to a definitive treatment facility. With the advent of the CCAT team, they didn't need to be stable anymore. But you could essentially take them directly off the OR table and get them on a plane back to wherever it needed to be in a matter of hours. The experience of being evacuated by plane, specifically by the Air Force, um, was really great. They knew anything and everything that needed to happen. They knew exactly how to do it. Each shot of the plane had a, um, like a nurse's aide. I'm not exactly sure what their term is, but they're like a medic that came to us to check on us. They checked on us every hour to make sure we had everything we needed. The medics always had a smile on their face. They always made you feel happy, you know, which is, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot. If uh, they're smiling, 
then that really helps you relax and not be so worried and so you know, I'm scared of the future. They're always saying it's going to be fine. You're going to be okay. They did a really, really good job of um, being there for the soldiers on the way back. Caring for patients in flight is a definite different entity than caring for patients in the hospital. Essentially, if you have problems in flight, you're stuck with whatever you brought on board with you. So carrying our equipment, anticipating the patient's needs. If we didn't bring it with us, we don't have it. Uh, if there's problems in the air, you got to deal with it. So it's just a matter of realizing that you're it. There's no help. You brought what you needed. And you do what you can. A boy said when he first saw this ship coming to take him home, it is as if God came out of the sky. But to the boys who have been on it, for all its magnificence and strength, it is a box, it is a wing, it is the way home. Coming back to the world, dying and going to heaven, whatever you want to say, it, um, a, a very tragic chapter of my life was closing. And I thought, well, this is just too good to be true. It ain't going to happen. This airplane's going to crash. You know, that's what, that's what I thought. But then it landed, and I got out, and there was... Ohio. I was home. I was on the ground, uh, and I was a civilian. It was good. Don't isolate yourself. Check. Hang out with buddies, but don't drink. Check. Immerse yourself in your family. Check. Now I have three kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I don't think I've. I don't think I've cracked the code on that one yet. Those are my homecomings. Stay busy. It's really hard at first. You just, it's like you're not, you're not ready to be home with your family. You just don't want to be around anybody but the people that you were with before. I wanted to go back, and that was part of the survivor's guilt. I wanted to go back really bad. Um, I felt like I, I, you know, I didn't do enough. I needed to be there. Uh, we left guys over there. It was the most probably devastating feeling at that point in my life that I had ever felt because. I felt like I had let myself down, my family down, and of course, everyone that I was serving with. Returning home from combat was a mixed bag. I felt relieved and like there was a weight off my shoulders. But then again, I wasn't happy with myself. I wasn't happy with the Army. I was happy to be home. I loved my family, but I wasn't living up to what they needed. I, I don't want to say I was angry, but I was, I was, I was in a rage when I, when I left the Marine Corps in 93. Um, At the grocery store, the shelves were full. Every single one of the shelves were completely full, and that pissed me off. And I still feel like I'm an outsider. I still feel like when I'm driving down the road that I'm visiting the country. Out here in the civilian world, you have to initiate everything. You have to pay rent. You have to pay electricity. You have to pay your cell phone bill. You have to go look at shit. You have to go shopping. You have to go buy clothes. You have to go study for this. It's so much easier over there. Life is simpler. When I told him I didn't have a forklift license, he said, well, I don't really have any use for you then. The biggest and the hardest transition from going from you know, military, I have all a sense of purpose, I have this mission, I have at least something to do every day that I can accomplish. When I was a civilian, I didn't feel like anything gave me real sense of purpose. And I'd never had anybody other than a Marine, a drill instructor or, or an instructor, somebody in a schoolhouse environment tell me that I was useless until that foreman that day said that. You, you know, you're useless to me. You know what, fuck you, useless. Returning home for me was a very difficult transition. When you're really catastrophically injured, uh, especially if you're an amputee or if you have paralysis, um, once you come out of that caregiver situation and you return home, everything from that point on not only becomes an unknown of how to get it done, but 
if you're in a jam, you also don't have that safety net that's right there at a moment's notice to help you out of it. So if I come home and I'm hungry and I go to scramble some eggs for the first time and then I can't figure out how to hold a pan still with a one arm while I use my prosthetic to flip an egg or something, it's, uh, it becomes an unknown and then there's something that's vital, uh, you know, not only for survival but also just for quality of life. It takes a lot for you to gain, to put your pride away a little bit, for you to say, I need help cooking something to eat, or I need help bathing myself in a unfamiliar environment. Uh, and, and that's things that, you know, other people just don't think about. And you have to forgive dumb questions on my part. You can ask anything you want. Really. Okay. Uh, this leg is made by Ottobock. It has a piston in it. Uh, you can see this piston. And oh, uh, it has a microprocessor computer in it also. So what that does is it senses, it has a, a sensor down near the foot and then one in the knee. So it senses where you are in your stride and how much weight you're loading on it. And by that it'll, if you're going downhill, it'll slowly bend to let you down, downhill or downstairs. But if you're walking on a flat surface, it'll swing fast just like you're walking normal. Uh, so it does all the thinking for you in terms of that kind of stuff and it's really good. It works really well. Uh, what I do have a problems with is <clears throat> you can see my leg is really short what I have left so um, because I don't have very much that can go in the socket uh, I get a lot of issues from that I have to wear this belt for stability mm -hmm. um, but I still get around pretty good there's ten times the effort to do any task now than there was before I was injured getting dressed bathing folding clothes doing laundry doing so that's really what my a day of my life has become all these uh, things I got to go over and under and around and through just to accomplish uh, something that would have been so easy before. I'm just going to do a final prep here. Sure. came back to duty down here uh, fishing is something that I did that really helped me out a lot and uh, helped me out so much I really wanted to share that with other military guys so I started uh, kind of planning to do it as a nonprofit um, but then uh, me and a buddy of mine got together and got to figure to make a legitimate business. This is myself and my teammate, Cliff. When I was blown up, Cliff was the first uh, team member to come to my aid. Fishing is always something that we talked about. You know, we were deployed anytime we got free time and talked about fishing. Uh, and of course, so would have it. Uh, you know, once we got our boat and we were so determined and all this, that, and the other, we started fishing and, uh, you know, we can catch fish all the time before that. And then we had a dry spell. And, and then finally, you know, we just kept sticking it out, kept going, kept going, kept staying determined. And then lo and behold, we had this great day where everything worked perfectly. Drags are screaming and we're chasing the fish and we're working together. And it's just exactly what we envisioned from day one. Uh, not for ourselves, but bringing that to others. I have pretty much spent my career in the last uh, 12 years as a combat rehabilitation, or better yet, as a trauma rehabilitation physician. Nowadays, when a soldier is wounded in combat, within about an hour, they are in a forward support hospital. Once they're stable, usually within 72 hours, they are back in the United States. Think about it. So this is a volunteer army. 
there's sort of like a natural selection process. It gets these, these young men and women in the military. In the blink of an eye, they are a cripple, they are a gimp. A huge loss of identity, uh, a huge sense of uh, emptiness, um, and it's difficult for them to accept it. I wouldn't be where I'm at today if all of this, you know, hadn't happened. It is my passion. It's our passion because it's me and Isaac. If we're not out physically every day, we're on the phone or doing emails, reaching out and trying to help and advocate and, and get people connected to the right person or organization that can help them to make their lives better. When I was um, admitted to Walter Reed, things were pretty much spiraling downward and, you know, and fairly quickly. And they said, we have one last option. It's a medicine called Reflutin. You can give it to her. It could possibly cause a heart attack or stroke like right away and kind of almost lessen your, your time to say goodbye. But it's our last effort. You know, it's our last ditch hope at this point. Luckily, it started to slow down all of the massive clotting that was taking place. But when I went into surgery, I guess my left leg had already was no good and it had to be amputated, you know, right below the knee. But the good thing is though, because the doctors being so incredible in their emergent care with me was that it prevented me losing both of my legs, like all the way, all the way up. But I like to say that, um, as part of my own stubbornness and my knowing somewhere that it wasn't my time, that I had more to do and I wasn't ready to say give up fighting. Piercing wounds in the body, I got six, uh, three in my right leg, uh, one in my left foot, one in my left forearm, and one in my left shoulder, which um, went to severe nerve damage in my left arm and my right leg. Um, they also had to put a rod down there and five screws in my right leg. And with my left uh, shoulder, the uh, surgeon had to completely rebuild uh, the left shoulder with about 10 screws. Yeah. <laughs> there are two mountains that they need to climb. The most obvious mountain they climb is the uh, physical deficiencies that they have. And that's, that's obvious. But there's also another mountain, and it's the emotional, psychological aspect. So these are the forces they fight, the trauma, sense of betrayal, sense of abandonment, sense of incapacity. The physical part moves right along. The emotional part tends to lag behind. This whole process of understanding what it's like to be you know, an amputee, because there's no, there's no manual, because amputation is just so unexpected. Right off the bat, I have been told I need to look more helpless. I need to look more helpless. Just because I've worked hard over the last two years to be able to walk down the street without my cane all the time and without a limp, people assume I'm perfectly fine and healthy. Whether or not I have shorts on, whether or not they can see my injury, they just assume that I'm perfectly healthy. Because guys, you know, under 30 should be able to kick back up and recover instantly like nothing ever happened. I'm sorry, it's not a video game. You can't just take a potion and heal up. So the automatic conclusion is that's really nice. You're training service dog. And I always come back around and obviously say, oh, no, no, Isaac is my service dog. He was trained for me. We've been together seven years. And then the next question always is, well, what's wrong with you? Come on. People work hard to be able to walk the way they were walking before their attack. Doesn't mean they can do it very long, but you want to tell them they're lazy, they don't deserve what they have because they can do that? So you're telling me that you'd rather us be lazy, actually be lazy, not care about our injuries, and let it get worse just so you feel better? And I remember one day just saying, wow, <laughs> okay. You have two choices. You can either be a victim and literally like roll over and just face the wall, or you can turn this around and make the best of it and take hold of this challenge and figure it out. 
and kind of look at it like it's a new mission. Great struggle comes great success, particularly because we push them and they start seeing all their amputees in the gym and little by little they start doing it. And as they start doing more, they start getting more psyched about it. They start seeing coming out of their shell, like I can do more, okay? And then they have the camaraderie. Um, they had a band of brothers when they were deployed. Now they have a new band of brothers on the same boat. I tell my guys, my patients, that I can never, ever tell them that I understand them because I'm not in their shoes. But I have empathy for them. And I think, I think that makes me a better person, better physician. I can somewhat relate. A typical day really was just getting up in the morning, doing your job and not thinking because you cannot get up and think. You're at war. You could go out that gate and never come back. We would literally get attacked every day, every single day. Every time a car would pass, you know, you just clench up and you're just hoping that it's not gonna explode. So that's how you live. That's how you live, and unfortunately, you have to, you do it. Um, you know, and you go out that gate, and you live like there's no hope, so you come back. So we go demobilize and get our briefs before the brief. And I don't want to mention a name, obviously, just saying, hey, listen, we've all been through some shit, we've all been through stuff. We've all seen stuff. We're all ready to go home. If anybody gets stuck here, we don't get to go home. We, we don't leave anybody behind. The unit goes together. So I wasn't obviously gonna be that guy, so I, obviously we check all, the, check all the boxes. No, nope, nothing bothered me, let's go home. I'm ready to drink beer and do what 19-year-old kids do. Um, legally. go from going 100 miles an hour a day to just almost a screeching halt. War is not fun, but it's, it, 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 your adrenaline's always going. I mean, it's just like so many emotions that go through you that you just, you know, at that, t at the, at that time, I, I, didn't, I couldn't explain and I didn't know, but I was on a plethora of anti-anxiety and mood stabilizers and everything. And I just did not like the way they made me feel. And plus you had to wait. Beer or whatever else, it, it works right now. Sure, you got a headache in the morning, or, but it works right now. This is the family. They can tell you their names if they would like to. Extended family. Uh, but you can't see the re uh, resemblance. <laughs> Things fell apart, so, and I had to rebuild it. And I don't want to do that again. So I'd rather take the hard road, and, and, and it may not be comfortable to um, talk about the things that you have to talk about. But if it helps in the long run to make me a better me, then. I have, to, I have to do that. So everything that's around me with family and, and my, my children and uh, my wife, very supportive, and my, uh, my in-laws and everybody, whole family all supportive, but I am definitely in the beginning stages of trying to heal. So it's gonna get worse before it gets better, and I know that, um, but I'm willing to take on the challenge, go through it, and hopefully, uh, you know, just learn how to deal with it. PTSD. With PTSD. The PTSD, but PTSD. PTSD. Uh, severe combat related PTSD. Definitely PTSD. And post traumatic stress disorder. Post traumatic stress. Post traumatic stress types of things. Uh, PTSD.
not diagnosed with it. As the classic diagnosis, uh, PTSD. Well, Doc, I guess they're on their own. Think they'll make the grade in civilian life? There's no reason in the world why they shouldn't. Some of them have the idea they'll be discriminated against because they've been nerve cases. If they'll just go about their business in a normal way, they'll soon forget about nerves and so will people around them. That's right, Doc, because when you come right down to it, they really haven't any tougher problem to face than any other returning serviceman. No, oh, the one thing they have to remember is that we wouldn't turn them out of here unless they were fit to face anything they might run into. I don't necessarily like labeling it as a disease or syndrome. Both, I feel like they have negative connotations to them. It's just, it's just post-traumatic stress. It is what it is. Post is after traumatic, something traumatic that happened to you. The disorder thing is the way, is the way that we don't like to look at it because it's not necessarily a disorder because it's not your fault. Um, but it is a stressor. Like, you know, stressors happen all the time. The normal reaction to abnormal situations, the whole experience is bad. Uh, like I said, war is not pretty. Um, and it's not meant to be. So all wars produce psychological trauma. In World War I, we called it shell shock. In World War II, we called it battle fatigue. The term PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, was not even invented till after the end of the Vietnam War. But now the term PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is well known. The way people see the world and see themselves after a trauma is different than the way they saw the world and they see themselves, saw themselves before the trauma. And so um, using a series of cognitive procedures, all of these treatments work to help people not get back to where they were before the trauma because they'll never get back to exactly where they were before, but to see the world in a more nuanced way. My PTSD, it manifested itself, you know, just through a variety of, uh, of, of episodes and in more ways than I could handle. And, you know, for years, I, I didn't think there was anything, well, I knew something was wrong with me. I just didn't know what it was. Um, I just thought I was an asshole. And I probably am. I didn't know I was being a jerk. But when, <laughs> when we're driving along and I scream at another driver for cutting somebody off or something, and my family's in the car, they wonder, what happened to Dad? You're going to have conflict and you're going to have confrontation. But you don't, you can't meet every conflict and confrontation with force. And that's what I did, anger. Immediately, if I was confronted or felt threatened, I mean, force was it. Things are tough when you come back. And things that seem little, like going to the mall, well, a lot of service members can't be in crowded places. Or driving, you're used to driving fast and erratically so that you won't run over the bomb or be shot at. And it's very hard to slow down. And if you see a pile of trash on the side of the road, do not startle and avoid it. So for many folks who have PTSD, the world becomes an unpredictably dangerous place. And if you live in an unpredictably dangerous world, then you do things to try and protect yourself and you do things to try and avoid that world as much as possible because you don't want bad stuff to happen. I do have a lot of the, the hypervigilance, the anxiety, suspiciousness, if you will. And, and part of it's not just PTSD, but it's an understanding that, at least I, maybe it is, I don't know, but that I'm never, I don't feel safe ever. Nothing was safe to me when in reality it's supposed to be even safer than Iraq and Afghanistan. But when you lose all those protective security measures, it kind of, you know, makes, makes you feel naked. I don't want that to go away. I don't think with this day and age, I think I, I'd rather be, I'd rather stay ready than have to get ready. You get that metallic taste in your mouth from seizing up and, and, uh, you reach for, you know, you, you start to reach for your rifle and it's not there. You become so accustomed to having security, because, but you lose all that sense of security when you come back to the United States. And it takes a long time to adjust to it.
Some guys don't ever adjust to it, which is unfortunate. Post-traumatic stress disorder from combat is different than PTSD in the civilian world. Now, it's a spectrum. It's not totally different, but it's different in a couple of ways. One is that soldiers who go to combat know they're going to war. They're prepared, they're armed, they're trained, and by and large feel pretty comfortable in that training. Service members who are exposed to things that they are trained to do are less likely to experience those things as traumas and develop PTSD subsequently. It's the things that fall outside of the realm of the things that I was trained to do that are more likely to produce those kinds of reactions. So it's not just about the people in uniform now shooting at the other people in uniform. It's about kids getting hurt. Um, when it's somebody I know, it's harder to keep it at a distance because this is somebody I know and cared about. My sense is it's that, that, that difficulty of keeping it at a distance, of, of keeping it the exercise for which I was trained. And instead, this is an issue about what happens to human beings when we go to war that is what people are likely to bring back with them. Okay, here we go. Right now, uh, with my recent uh, diagnosis that I got in December with the POT syndrome, uh, I got a timetable of five to ten years to uh, have any type of quality of life. I'm still kind of in shock from it. And I want to be able to walk my daughters down the aisle. I want to be able to be there for my family. I'm taking a video. Oh, so I got hit by a few IEDs, one big one that uh, actually ended up retiring me. Uh, I split our vehicle in half. I don't really remember too much of the blast, just uh, kind of coming to, waking up, and a lot of medical attention. And then uh, National Defense, we call it Firewatch Ribbon. Everybody gets it when you join at a time of conflict. It's our Afghanistan Campaign Medal, Global War on Terrorism Expeditionary Medal. Unit really, the worst part has been the aftermath. Uh, the coming home, trying to reintegrate and uh, accept that your life has changed. Uh, you know, you, you go from, I got hit when I was 22, uh, the last time I got hit, and uh, you go from being 22 and in great shape, being able to do whatever you want to do, to I got to walk with a cane and can't get on the floor and play with my kids. You know, when people start putting timetables on your life, that's what makes it most difficult. Quality of life when you have a, a head injury and you have a heart condition is, is similar to ALS. Um, and POTS is an autonomic disease or syndrome disorder, whatever you want to call it. Basically, because my heart and my brain don't know how to talk to each other and level everything out. Um, and eventually, my body will just kind of shut down or I have a heart attack and that'll be it. But it's caused by trauma. And blast trauma that I took is what caused it. So it's... Uh, it's the hand I'm dealt, and I can't really do anything about it. I just got to take it a day at a time. And, and that shit's tough. You know, I mean, getting, you know, nobody wants to hear they're dying or they're going to die. I mean, it, nobody makes out of here alive. But when you go through some of the things that I went through and saw and stuff like that, and it's like, I can't be it. You know, I, I can't, I can't just be done with that. You know, it, it's got to keep going. She wiped her face and she was like, Mommy, can I hold your hand? She walked but away. They get everything they want, trust me. They got me in their phone. They will appreciate it. They have many toys are us. They're fine. You know what? I, I look at my kids. What about under here? There he is. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a real bad day. I could barely walk. I was real dizzy. Um, had two seizures already. Uh, and I went to my daughter's school to uh, watch their, you know, they were walking around in all their Halloween costumes and things like that. And, uh, couldn't make it back to the car. Uh, two ladies came over and helped my wife get me back in the vehicle. My wife took me to the hospital. On the way to the hospital, I uh, had another seizure. It was a pretty massive one. Um, and as soon as we pulled in, uh, my wife ran inside and said, I need some help getting my husband out of the car. A uh, guy comes out, first thing he says is, oh, heroin overdose. And um, it, was, it was pretty disheartening to go into a medical facility, especially a civilian one, 
and you know you're telling them everything that's been going on over the last five years and they're not listening to you the entire time and it's also a pretty shitty thing for someone to just come out and look at someone and say oh a heroin overdose and it was it was nuts hmm. The best memories I have in life are without a doubt my children. Uh, getting married and having kids, um, getting to hold them for the first time and watch them grow and uh, look at me and call me daddy and uh, showing me new things that they learn and me teaching them things. Those are absolutely the best memories. But where I'm at in life is still here. You know, I look at every day as a blessing. Every day that I, after the day I got blown up, you know, they call it your life day because that's the day that your life changed and things like that. Um, I'm blessed and I'm happy that I'm still here. Uh, I've had a lot of my buddies that have taken their own lives and uh, it makes it tough. Um, but I know that I have a support system in my wife and my kids that I'm gonna do whatever I can before I leave them behind. So he stepped in front of me and uh, he functioned an IED, uh, cutting me in half. Uh, I took fragmentation from the IED and from him. I was knocked back. I was an MRAP and we hit a uh, pretty big IED. Long a vehicle convoy and uh, roadside bomb um, went off. literally blown through the air. It was so dusty that the blood was pretty much dry. Um, I remember looking at that and, and thinking that was weird. Many people think of the signature wounds of this war as post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury, TBI. General Schoomaker talks about the signature weapon of the war, and the signature weapon is a blast. So with wounded Army service members, and again, most have been wounded by blast, but not all, you have to take into account everything that's going on. The concussion on the battlefield usually doesn't happen in isolation. Um, particularly blast concussions, there's other stuff going on and people are being injured and potentially killed and, and there's that sense that maybe your own life is in danger or a buddy's life is in danger. And so that rarely happens on the football field. Blast as a whole occurs in a, a complicated environment so that an individual is often affected by multiple aspects of the blast. So. It's very difficult to isolate a primary blast injury in a human blast because there's a lot, a lot of things that happen during the explosion itself. There can be associated motor vehicle accidents. There can be other types of injuries that may occur as well as the explosion itself. I come to uh, with feeling someone pulling me and uh, immediately on a site, I start fighting the person off and, they, and it's Doc and Doc saying, hey, you'd be all right, you'd be all right. I can hear uh, Ears are ringing real bad, but I know we're getting shot at. I can still hear it. Um, and he's freaking uh, wiping stuff off me or something, trying to relax me a little bit. And uh, I can't see. And I'm looking out through this thick bulletproof glass at this countryside of this war that we're fighting. And the next thing I know, the only thing I see is dirt. And I can't really, at that point in time, I can't put two and two together and come up with four. They say, hey, freaking, we got another wounded when you get on, on deck or we, you have one more wounded on, on station. I'm like, no, I don't. And, then, and Doc's like, it's you. And I'm like, so I get back on my radio, I just tell them to get the fuck off my LZ. And they take off, dust off takes off. And you know, back in my clinic, when we have folks who come in for traumatic brain injury, there's a particular number of things that we have to ask them to check their cognitive level. You know, and a lot of folks had memorized a lot of the answers to the question, you know, they didn't want to be taken away from their unit, you know, their brothers. So here I am in this hospital being asked all these questions. And of course, care providers make the worst patients. Come back out of uh, the aid station after being checked by the battalion surgeon, who says I have to stay at Fob Marja for uh, 20 days for observation. 
and uh, Weapons Company 26. One of their vehicles was happened to be, one of their convoys happened to be there getting resupplied for us for our combat outpost. I said, hey, sir, are you going back? Look left, look right. We uh, got back in the trucks and went back to our combat outpost. In the civilian world, most of the time, a TBI, traumatic brain injury, a mild one, a concussion, is sustained in sports or maybe in a motor vehicle accident. And most of the time, it's relatively limited. But with a service member, you need to be treating all of the injuries. If you, for example, are treating the traumatic brain injury but ignoring the pain, then your treatment's not going to be successful. If you've had a concussion in a civilian setting, like, for example, you're playing football and you get your head clobbered, you're extremely unlikely to develop PTSD or depression from that event. But if you experience a concussion on the battlefield, particularly one that involves loss of consciousness, there's a reasonably good chance you'll develop PTSD or depression as a result of that event as well. The two overlap, and the best way to really get at managing that, in, in my experience, is to have an integrated care team where you have psychologists, psychiatrists, mental health providers embedded in your TBI treatment team. And that's, I think, the goal of many locations throughout the VA and military system. It removes some of the stigma when my patients come to the same clinic space to see me in a rehab clinic area, and they also see the mental health provider. It makes them more comfortable. They're not walking into the behavioral medicine or psychiatry clinic area. I get concerned when individuals attribute their memory problems or concentration problems or sleep problems or sense of sadness and depression or anxiety to the fact that they've had TBI um, as opposed to the fact that they might be depressed or, or have PTSD. These symptoms that individuals experience after mild traumatic brain injury in a combat environment can blend in with the other milieu of operational activities. They have a high operational tempo, sometimes because of uh, will that I'm not going to see a doctor because I can't leave my unit behind. If we treat these patients early on, the vast majority of them can get back to normal full duty. But we have to address it appropriately and avoid the risk of cumulative or multiple injuries, which unfortunately for many of our combat soldiers is all too common. And what I will say to you, I would say in front of you, to you, about you, getting checked out isn't going to change what you are. It's not going to change who you are. You go get looked at and you get diagnosed or they tell you what's going on and you're still going to be the Marine I follow into hell. I think that I have a TBI. I don't know the severity of it. I don't want to, but and, and the resources are out there for me. I'm just choosing not to take advantage of it because I don't want to know. Why don't you want to know, guy? I'm not broken. If you had a traumatic brain injury, would you think of yourself as broken? Yes. What, what are you fearful about finding out if you have a TBI? Yeah, I'm a wounded warrior, not a wounded victim. Yeah. Best memory in life. Probably when I came back from Afghanistan. <laughs> Definitely, uh, just that feeling of of uh, being safe or you know so at first when I, when I realized that you know like my injuries may not be compatible to to you know go out in the, in the real world um that was kind of a you know uh, a stressful time because I was like I don't know I mean like I, I I don't know what I should do and you know like would I be even able to to do this would I be able to transition back into to civilian life um I'm here at, at you know at the university because I'm I'm studying psychology and I'm um I actually I, I, want, I want to get into uh, mental mental health uh, counseling for for veterans. It's hard because for me I I'm older than the normal average uh, you know undergraduate student and everything, and so I have a lot of difficulty in in trying to um, 
connect with other people because just I, I feel as if I'm I'm like an old man. <laughs> everything that he's experienced is before that. CVs, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure some good VA people out there, the workers are typically pretty good. I think it's the system more or less is broken half the time. I go in for uh, problems focusing and they're just like, oh, we'll take these these pills right here. They'll, you know, they'll be at your door in a couple weeks. And I, I get there and the side effects list is like, I hold it up and I had a picture, I had him take a picture. It was taller than me. The uh, the paper that came with it, it unfolded like one of those billfold things. He was having issues where he said he would smell dead bodies all the time. So they put him on meds and uh, he never complained about it to me, but I just remember when he started doing his meds, he completely changed, was, he used to be a fun loving guy, like always cracking jokes about something. And if he got on his meds, he would just sit there. They use that because they don't have enough time. You know, like the yeah. VA is just like so fucked up that they're just like, they don't have enough time. So they just use this sort of like that, that those preconceptions, that sort of script to run off yeah. of. And so that it's just like easy in and out, you know, here's some meds, you know, go drool somewhere. I've heard a couple of other people who just get pills thrown at them. And it's like, that's not what the solution I want is. And I wouldn't really want to have that like that's not what I want for me. VA is kind of in flux right now and it's it's um it's hard to get an appointment scheduled which is really weird so I'm, I'm trying to schedule an appointment and like and uh, uh I'm like I just want to see you know I just need to like you know make sure that I'm, I'm doing okay and everything and they're just like well yeah just this calls back in a week so I call them back in a week and they would do the same thing and I'm like all right so I just kind of gave up on that so I don't know uh, that was a few weeks ago but I don't know I'm, I don't know. Can't have it. It's 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 so weird seeing this back out in place and having it not be perfect is it bothers me right now. I'm just like it has to be perfect. The organization that I was that you know that I was part of was definitely um, something I, I definitely took a lot of pride in. Yeah, no, I I definitely want to change it, and I, I definitely feel like I'm I am part of it. There was this, like famous quote. I'm paraphrasing, but uh. A lot of people struggle throughout life not knowing if they made a difference. Marines never have to worry about that. Well, the Veterans Administration uh, system tries to do a, a huge amount of continuous care. Um, and uh, it struggles with it uh, because of its geographic distribution uh, and trying to cover the entire country. It struggles with it about trying to look after homeless. It struggles with it about trying to look after uh, the aged population. They're taking a much bigger bite of the general welfare of a uh, veteran than does the average um, civilian healthcare delivery system. bureaucracy in the VA is ultimately what it takes to get that sort of standard of care. And a lot of times when you come from the civilian world, you sort of look at it as like, oh, there's too many reminders, there are too many this, you know, CPRS. But if you think about, if you weigh that in the context of what's the ultimate care that's being provided to the veterans, you know, are they getting the standard of care that they need? And are they getting their needs met? Because anything this big is going to be complicated. There's no way to, to build something and keep it simple at this level. Well, it looks like you were supposed to go to Pittsburgh back in July of 2011. And like, so in December of 2012, I got a letter that I missed my appointment. <laughs> you guys are a little backed up. And now she has to do extra paperwork on why she lost my paperwork. But if she turns it in and it's not there, then I did something wrong because apparently I didn't turn it in. So no extra paperwork for her. She doesn't look bad, but I do. Service nor your duty assignment uh, puts you in contact with stressors. You know, anybody that would look at my record that saw where I was in 1967, uh, a line outfit in the Marine Corps, <laughs> uh, uh, 
obviously I was subject to stress. I had to fight, literally fight, fight her and yell with her to get medication. Um, and then when it became, when we got to the point where it's like, okay, we'll give you medication, she wanted to shoot me with a bazooka of drugs. They've been in that clinic and it's two, three, four, or five different people that have seen them over the last six months and each one's diagnosing something different. Of course, you know, they walk out feeling that care is not going well and they're overprescribed things. Uh, you know, what we're doing is we're taking something that was very well intentioned. Uh, you know, how, how could you have better intentions than taking care of our, of our heroes, those who have served? Uh, and, and yet, it's become a vast bureaucracy that doesn't really serve the needs of our folks. Uh, so, you know, you can keep tinkering with it, you can keep tweaking it, you can keep adding things on, uh, but, you know, the more you tack things on, the more it looks like a monstrosity that, that doesn't really resemble what you intended it to be. So what we really need to do is rethink the VA system. We need to put the, the veteran at the center of our thought process, and we need to serve the veteran. <sighs> You know, you have to have been living in a cave to see that the VA doesn't make it into the press pretty much every day, and it's not usually for something positive. And for many of us who, who get up every morning because we want to try to do the best job possible, come to work because we like working with patients and working in an environment that can provide holistic care, I think it's often um, a challenge to keep sort of all the rest of the stuff in the background and keep doing what we know needs to be done. challenge to recruit the very best doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals. That's a challenge. To make sure that everybody works together in a collaborative way, that can be a challenge. To look at all of the systems that we employ and try to make them as efficient as we possibly can, that's a challenge. You know, they've been under the radar, or excuse me, under the, under the microscope, um, the VA has. So, I believe here uh, at my facility that, uh, that I go to, um, I think they do an excellent job. Um, it's not the one I work at either. In Alaska, they, they did a really good job of making sure that we had all of our needs met and that we had access to them. But he really took the time uh, to see what I needed, see if I had any pain, see if I had any questions, make sure I had all the, the, the labs taken. And honestly, I, if it hadn't been for that doctor, I don't think that, I don't think my vision would have been saved. And I remember that to this day. On polytrauma, I actually flew in a specialist from Texas uh, to uh, take care of him. And uh, the veteran didn't show up. But the doctor was supposed to leave that night, of course, after the consult for, and then uh, referral to, I guess, wherever they need to go next. Um, so he stayed on another day for the guy. As far as the VA, the worst part, I don't have a worse part with the VA. I've had surgery there. I've been through countless hours of therapy. I just looked at my record, and then the last year, I've been there 67 times. Um, I don't have a bad thing to say about them, except that they're short of people. They're short of docs. They're short of, of nurses. They're just short of people. Sometimes you hit hurdles that obviously you have hurdles every day, but some of them just get to you worse than other days. Uh, you know, you really have long looks in the mirror asking yourself, was it worth it? Uh, was losing these limbs or having these in injuries or difficulties, uh, was it worth it?
So I was injured in June of 2012, uh, June 9th to be exact. I spent three months in inpatient, um, recovering from certain injuries and having over 30 surgeries. And this was taken on December 30th of that same year, 2012, where uh, I accomplished the main goal of proposing to the love of my life, uh, now my wife. Um, this was a big, big moment. Even if you have ambition and you have determination, there's always that one, one little bit in the back of your mind that you're not sure things are really possible. But when you stay determined and you stay oriented and you make them happen, you prove to yourself that it is possible, not through just what you want to happen, but that you show yourself and you prove that through ambition and determination and uh, remaining focused, anything is possible. My first best memory in life uh, happened just over two months ago. My son was born. And this little boy is all that I think about. Every day I'm out on the water or readying equipment or relearning how to tie knots uh, with a prosthetic in one hand or my whole life I, I've always done things a lot better when I'm devoted towards some bigger some bigger vision and this is exactly that big vision Even if I fail at things that on a paper sense, you know, with the business or, you know, uh, some other things that I've done, uh, I am most definitely not ever going to fail because I left any stone unturned. Uh, and that is exactly the type of example that I plan on setting for my son, that it's all about you and what you're doing uh, much more than uh, what's actually going on. Anything is possible. And the testimonies that have been given don't come easily. We've learned combat is hard, but it is only one part of the fight our men and women in uniform often face. The military-civilian gap implies that a bridge needs to be built. The soldiers and medical professionals in this film have taken the first step. They have opened up. They have given you a glimpse into the complexity of veteran care and ideas for best practices. The veterans have shared their struggles and most importantly, their resilience. They still fight every day and are looking for partners in their campaign. All of us can be a part of their journey to not just survive, but thrive. A veteran's path to true healing starts when one doctor, surgeon, or nurse takes that extra moment to ask the right questions, to listen, to look a little deeper. Medical professionals can match them step for step and bridge the gaps. Meet them in the middle and embrace these men and women as fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, friends and neighbors. Join them on their journey walk together on a mission galvanized by respect and dignity and become a strong companion on their path to true healing.